The pack seems to be functioning for them. It seems to give them that platform, which allows them to play off. So I think that's that's pretty good. But as Rob said, they don't have that strike winger capability that they're going to score undoubtedly out there. So they do have to manufacture something. I just wonder against better, more consistent defences, are they going to come unstuck if they can't thread that ball out wide? to someone who can finish it and their defence was strong in this game as well wasn't it That that's certainly yeah. something that we've seen in the last two or three games from Castleford but Saints weren't firing last week Hull, Hull were a million miles away from firing this week weren't they it seemed like it seemed like their um, halfbacks deliberately didn't want to create rather, rather than the opposite I mean when the tries were that try that was short from Massey Matongo and the interception by Carlos Tumavavi who actually seemed to have an, an okay game. Jack Logan break, broke away for the, the try that gave him his place in the stats roundup. But um, yeah, the, 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 there's, there's good stuff going on for Cass, isn't there? But it, it's hard to know for sure if the story isn't how diabolical Hull FC were rather than just That's... how great Cass were, which they were. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's that's probably it, and I think there is, and yeah, if we're talking playoffs, there is a question mark around Cass's big game ability. They're they're another side similar to Saints that have got this question mark of what happens to them when they get under the spotlight. Do they do they melt away? Whereas Hull FC have demonstrated some big game ability in the last four or five years. It's they just can the still get the playoffs. This is yeah. after after some of these performances they've had this year. This being the latest of those absolute spankings. What it just blows my mind that they could still still be in the playoffs because they've knocked away plenty of wins. Just they've they've lost disastrously when they lose, don't they? Yeah, it is a very shiny rock or a very a very hard diamond or the way around. So Jake um, Truman was the star of the show, wasn't he? Um, de- he quite, was quite the, the real away, diamond yeah. in the rough, as it were, in this game. Who, who else were your star performers? Um, I think, yeah, I think Liam Watts, you know, he, he gave that, that thing, that, that platform, helped do that. Um, Mike McMeekin, I think, did well as well. Anyone for Hull FC? <sighs> no. I'll I'll give a mention then for Tavita Satai, who I thought looked really strong, but I'm 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 not sure what length of spells he's going to be able to perform. Uh, you know the amount of minutes he'll be able to do, but if they can build up that through the off season with him, I think they've got a prospect on the hands of a of a strong performer next year because he did look good in moments. Um, as any as good as any whole player managed to look anyway in, in this game and also I've got a weird feeling you know that someone was yanking Bill Arthur's chain when they said that he's called Chris because <laughs> I just think that'd be <laughs> hilarious so I hope that that's the truth rather than rather than knowing it is or not <laughs> anyway yeah highlight moment then of the game for you what was that oh uh, was it Truman's first or his second the one where he completely the- outpaced Jamie Shaw. Yeah, that, yeah, that we absolutely second, yeah. did him. Yeah, there's that one. Yeah, it just absolutely blew him away, and it was it was very nice to watch. Excellent. Um, that's Thursday done. Then let's move on to Friday night when um, we're going to first talk about. I don't know why I've done these out of alphabetical order, but it's the way I've done them. We're going to talk about Leeds hosting the Salford Red Devils. It was 14-6 to the visiting Red Devils at half time. It finished 20 points to 12 to Salford over Leeds. Uh, 12,436 were there. Liam Moore was also there as the referee. In terms of the stats, um, they were fairly even, actually, with close metres numbers and a split in who won the other stats, Salford made fewer errors and had better team tackle success, so went on to win, despite Leeds making more breaks and conceding fewer penalties. Individually, uh, consistently on the stats roundup, man in steel in waiting maybe, Jackson Hastings with one try assist, seven tackle busts and 135 metres. Ken Seo had 142 metres. Josh Jones, uh, who will undoubtedly improve Hull FC next year, you have to feel. 11 tackle busts and 138 metres. And George Griffin, uh, back with a strong performance. Double stats hit here. 55 tackles, 13 of which were marked tackles, and 110 metres. Outstanding effort from uh, from George Griffin uh, there. For Leeds, br- this is brilliant. This one. Um, returning I was going to call the, this one out. Yeah. Yeah. Returning to the side, Stevie Ward with 40 tackles. That's great to see. From the bench as well. So you made 40 tackles 
and he hadn't started the game. He underlines his leadership credentials, doesn't he, there, in, in showing his teammates the way to be. And by coming back in, in early September, proves he is Leeds' answer to O'Loughlin. Uh, Ash Hanley, 147 metres, Luke Briscoe, 117 metres, and Reese Martin, 102 metres. We did get a fan view in on this one, Tim. Yep, from Josh, and he said, first game all season where I had no nerves, which was nice. Leeds' defence was good. But when attacking, we looked like a team with nothing to play for. But most importantly, we didn't roll over. Salford looked nervy and not as fluid in attack as I have seen in the past. But with Jackson Hastings running the show and an all-round team effort, Salford showed where they are in the playoffs. Leeds' tries came off the back of penalties and soft defence on Salford's line. All the press was about the flair. One knob... Oh, right, sorry. All the press, as in the coverage, mm. was about the flair. I was thought he was meaning about defence. Um, one knob doesn't count for all. I spent time with Salford fans after the match and they were nothing but embarrassed by the event. Yeah, I suppose we better cover this. Yeah, so um, it's not the first incident of, of a flare being in a stadium this season. It's not the first incident of a flare ending up on the pitch um, this season either. Uh, I'm not aware of it happening this year with the Salford fans, but I know flares have been an issue for... for for Salford before, as they have been for Michael Wigan Warriors, as they as they have been for numerous Cass. other clubs as well. Um, I I would say I I don't really care whether the guy was a week in week out supporter or goes four or five times a year. The guy who brought the flare or the guy who threw it onto the field, um, who I'm led to believe were different people. I think it was thoroughly dangerous and um, idiotic to to take flares into grounds anyway to pass it around or whatever they seem to apparently have been doing and then to throw it on the pitch all of it is completely uh, disgusting and embarrassing and I'm glad if you've ever seen if you've ever seen a flare at close quarters because I've done some training that involves you know you have to be able to use one um, just to prove you can and they're not you know that they are two bits of metal that are set fire to themselves at a ridiculously high temperature to produce the amount of smoke they do they are not safe you know I've done it wearing safety gloves at a safe distance where I could just put it straight into water. And it's actually quite a nerve wracking thing to be holding it and the amount of heat it gives off and the amount of smoke. It's not fun. I don't know if these so, ones are quite exactly the same as the ones you would use in your diving and that sort of stuff, but they're obviously very, very similar. They're, they're some sort of pyrotechnic that doesn't belong in the hands of a, of a fan on the terrace, does it? Yeah, around that many people and around you know that length of you know that the amount of burns and the amount of produ- they're not there's just it's just not necessary and I don't even I don't even understand what people gain from them if that makes sense because I don't I don't understand what the like there are things I don't do but I can understand why people do them I. Like, I, like, I like drugs for example I can, I can understand why you would do it because of what you get back from it with a flare I don't understand what the profit is the suggestion that it adds to the atmosphere is, is utter bollocks because in my opinion when I've been involved in being at Wigan games where flares have gone off in, in the relatively recent past although thankfully it seems to have stamped out a little bit unless some little knob shit will think this is a fucking good idea to get himself on TV soon and that'll really piss me off um but it, unless that happens, hopefully we've rid ourselves of this issue. But um, my experience is actually what you end up with is everyone else stops singing and starts saying what a fucking prick, and and it kills the atmosphere. So apart from the ten or twelve people who are involved with the little shit with the flare, so um, I want to, you know weed these people out, make sure that they are escorted to any game that they go to by a childminder. Um, to make sure that they don't take these pieces of uh, dangerous equipment into games. But let's talk about the rugby, um, because we shouldn't let one or two uh, individuals overshadow what has been a fantastic season for Salford. And, and this kind of just confirms all of that. This is the first time they've done the double over leads. OK, not a fantastic lead side, but first time they've done the double over leads for, I think, if I'm right, for like 60 odd years or something ridiculous. Um I'm sure I read that in one of the match reviews I read of this game. It sounds like all the all the key men were there front row and centre for Salford again. I mean, it does sound like Tui Lola here had flashes that show the Leeds fans what he could have been if they if he was treated right there or used right there probably is the is the better word rather than expected to 
run the show actually being the player that he is which is what Ian Watson just all he wants him to be all he expects him to be um, sounds like he was okay but it's it's Josh Jones it's Jackson Hastings it's Nia Levels I mean Josh Jones and Jackson Hastings they're, they're both going to be huge losses for Salford in, in 2020 um, not only they're going to be losses for each other as well I think because they do link up very well uh, they, yeah. they they sort of uh, buzz well off each other's kind of core skills because Jackson Hastings is an all around threat who's got a fantastic running game as a halfback which is a very dangerous thing when he can pass and kick as well as he can do as well and what Josh Jones is is, is a man who creates broken play with his yeah, with, he, his, he dra- with his size draws that uploading pe- ability and he draws that extra man in because you've got to stop him exactly well he or sometimes even if he doesn't draw the extra man in he at least has the he bumps off a man doesn't he so yeah he creates an extra man situation kind of thing um so yeah they're going to be huge losses for each other as well as for Salford I think next year Evels he he flashed as well calling further into question what he needs to do to get the top level international recognition that he deserves because um you know I can keep saying it every week but he he's better than Jamie Shaw um <laughs> anyway um so yeah so those three players in particular they flashed on the highlight reels they jumped out of me of the page of the match reports that I've read so, you know the, these are the men that, that run the show there and um, very exciting play, players that they're taking this side into the playoffs uh, really it it would be a ridiculous turn of events for them to not get in the playoffs wouldn't it at this stage uh, Hull would need yeah. to score about 150 points I think Evold's open opening try that would be the highlight and also, that's, sorry that's Hull would need to concede we need to score 150 points and not concede yes true. Lot, you know the, the amount they have been in recent weeks um, highlight moment for me was Evold's opening try I think it had so much of what we recognised Salford for not just this year, but especially this year. I mean, there was Chris Ninu making a speculative offload on the left-hand side. If it's not Josh Jones doing it, it's Chris Ninu doing it. Um, and and that ball landed in the ever-ready, the ever-scheming Hastings. I mean, Hastings was then pulling defenders into places they don't want to be. He got right into the middle of the pitch. He, he, he had big blokes trying to tackle him. And, and he just is too quick off the mark for, for those guys. So he, he did that. And then it had Evold supporting him to, to dot it down underneath the, the post. I mean, Evold's fantastic throwback to the to the supporting fullback of, of yesteryear. But he can ball play a little bit as well because he, he got on the end of a lovely passing move to set up a try as well again in this game, which we've seen him do tons and tons of time as well. Uh, Niall Evold's not in the Great Britain Elite Performance Squad. Um, so, yeah, th- that's... I think although the stats and the scoreline were relatively close and actually Harry Newman was inches away from reeling in an interception in the last 10 minutes of the game that would have seen Leeds go ahead at at that stage um, very late on so it could have ended differently here Salford had to defend a lot in this game so for all those plaudits I've talked about the attacking stuff because that's what we see on the highlight reels it sounds from the match reports that Salford had to do and what Ian Watson's talked about as well after this game is Salford had to do a lot of defending and and edge this out. Now Leeds Rhinos aren't the Leeds Rhinos of, of yesteryear, but they are still, you know, a big side who who can create some intensity. So I, I think this has set Salford up well for, for for the playoff push, having to defend a lot in a game and still manage to execute their plays at the other end of the field. And of course, Joey Lussick ran over for a try from dummy half, which he hasn't done for so long that I sort of thought... Um, he forgot how to do it. The, the, the kind of... It had been broken, his spell on the on rugby league defences, but, but not so. Yeah, right. That's, that is that game. Mm. What's the next game, Tim? <laughs> Moving on. Uh, elsewhere on Friday night, it finished Hull Kingston Rovers 16... London Broncos 20 having been 6-14 to the away side at half time in front of 8,020 people and refereed by one Mr James Child now London were the deserved winners by the numbers particularly the attacking and defensive efficiency figures a 1 metre per carry better average gain with the ball and a 4.2% better team tackle success rate without the ball with efforts and Sorry, errors and breaks even. Hulkow gave away fewer penalties, although London made 131 more metres. Luke Yates for the London side, making 63 tackles, 12 of those from marker. 
Kieran Dixon. You're and his 